Hi guys, welcome to the cellular respiration notes. Uh, these are the notes that you're going to use to help you answer the cellular respiration questions. You're going to have a quiz sometime next week, probably middle of the week, Wednesday or Thursday. So just kind of be prepared. It's going to be on photosynthesis and cell respiration. You're going to get a study guide for that and probably some sort of quizzes or some sort of review to help you with it. So I'm going to go back and forth between these cellular respiration notes, and I'm also going to go back and forth between um, the cellular respiration flow chart that I posted on Google Classroom. I really like the way the flow chart kind of um, goes through and explains cellular respiration and fermentation to you guys all in on one page. Uh, normally I would draw it on the board as we did the PowerPoint, but obviously that's not really an option right now. So uh, I when you know at home i went and drew it all out for you guys and uh, made sure to scan it in and i'm going to post it so you'll have it uh, for you, for yourself to study all right so we already talked about photosynthesis and what photosynthesis does is it takes you know the sun's light and it converts it into glucose the problem is we can't just use glucose as energy glucose is like your food right so you can't just use food you have to eat it and you have to digest it in order to get the energy or break the bonds in that food uh, to release the energy to use it. Okay, so essentially what cellular respiration does is it takes that glucose, breaks those, those C6, remember C6, H12, O6 is glucose, it breaks those carbons down, breaks those bonds and releases energy. And that energy that's released is called ATP, which we've mentioned before, adenosine triphosphate. So ATP is an energy molecule that has three phosphates, hence the ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Uh, where that energy is stored is in that third bond of the third phosphate. So what happens is I have ATP and that third bond that's attached there gets broken and that's where the energy is released that we can use. <clears throat> So glucose gets broken down to give us ATP and ATP is what can release the energy that we can use. So who goes through cellular respiration? Uh, plants go through cellular respiration and so do animals. So we all go through it. So yes, plants go through photosynthesis and they make glucose, but they still need to break that glucose down through cellular respiration in order to, to extract the energy from the glucose. All right, so let's get started. So the definition. Cellular respiration is the breaking down of molecules to obtain energy or ATP. So essentially glucose goes in, okay, it turns into pyruvate. Um, and then whether there is oxygen present or oxygen not present, that's going to decide whether we need to go through cellular respiration or fermentation. So um, cellular respiration is breaking that glucose down into ATP, okay? And that breaking of bonds is going to give us energy. So where does it happen? So remember, we always talk about how the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And this is the thing that in biology, you're going to always remember. For some reason, that's the thing that everybody remembers from biology. You won't be able to tell me what a nucleus is, but you can totally tell me what a mitochondria is. It's powerhouse of the cell. But what does that exactly mean? The powerhouse of the cell means that it you know, gives the cell energy. So this is where cellular respiration happens. Glycolysis, which is the very first step of cellular respiration, Okay, it's this part right here. This doesn't happen in the mitochondria. Only when oxygen is present do we go into the mitochondria to give us a ton of ATP, okay? So everything else, glycolysis, fermentation, those are gonna be happening in the cytosol. And if you remember what cytosol is, cytosol is that liquidy portion of the cytoplasm outside of the mitochondria or all other organelles. So mitochondria, what does it look like? It has this double membrane. Um, with an inner membrane highly folded. And this increases the surface area to make it more efficient. If you think about it, we like to have more surface area, right? Remember, we always talk about how more surface area means a more efficient cell. If I have a larger cell with less surface area, they're not going to diffuse as fast. So this folded membrane gives the, the mitochondria a ton of surface area. So therefore, um, it can diffuse really quickly. So that's why we like to have those double membranes and that folded inner membrane. So what happens in the mitochondria? Well, the Krebs cycle uh, and the electron transport chain. So you'll see in these notes that you see ETC, the letters ETC a lot. And ETC is that last part of cellular respiration that's gonna give us the most ATP um, or energy molecules in all of cellular respiration. Okay, it's gonna give us a ton. So those two things happen in the mitochondria. Everything else happens in the cytosol or right outside of the mitochondria in the cytoplasm. And that inner membrane space is just the space between the inner and outer membrane. So it's this area right here. 
So we already talked about the chemical equation of photosynthesis. The nice thing is the chemical equation of photosynthesis is the exact opposite of cellular respiration. So instead of glucose coming out and oxygen coming out of the photosynthesis uh, chemical equation, both of those things go in. So now they are both the reactants. So you have C6H12O6, which if you remember is a molecule of glucose, okay? We also take in oxygen and then what do we get out? We our react our products are carbon dioxide, water, and ATP or that energy molecule. So again, it's flip flopped, right? So before we had going in, we had carbon dioxide, water, and instead of ATP, what did we have going into photosynthesis? We had light. Okay, so that's the one change here from photosynthesis to cellular respiration. So both plants go and animals go through cellular respiration, and this is where food is broken down gradually in order to obtain energy. So there are three main parts, okay? There are three parts are glycolysis, okay? Uh, the Krebs cycle and the ETC or the electron transport chain. We are gonna mention one step that's in between glycolysis and the Krebs cycle called the intermediate step, but I'll mention that um, in the next slide. So there are three main parts. Glycolysis, this is gonna occur in the cytosol. It turns a glucose into a pyruvate and you get two ATP out of this. So in glycolysis, you get you put two ATP to in to run glycolysis, but you end up getting four out. So what we say is there are two net gained ATPs in glycolysis. Okay, and what that does is it takes the six carbon molecule that we had C six H twelve O six, and it splits it. Okay, it splits it right down the middle. So now instead of having one six carbon molecule, I now have two three carbon molecules. It's pretty much the only thing you have to know there is just that glycolysis splits glucose in half and I net two ATP. So I still get some energy from glycolysis. Is it a lot? Not much. Okay. After those two, three carbon pyruvates, there are two possible options that, that can happen. And I'm going to go switch to this guy here. So this is the flow chart. Okay. I know it looks scary. Calm down. All right. It's going to be okay. So what happens is I have my six carbon glucose, it goes in, okay? And that was from photosynthesis, right? Two ATP goes into glycolysis as well. And that six carbon glucose is split in half, okay? Into two, three carbon pyruvates. I also get net two ATP out of it. So I really get four ATP, but, but since I already used two ATP to run glycolysis, I only net two ATP. So that's the first part, right? Glucose goes into glycolysis, split into two, three carbon pyruvates. Notice here, I also have this molecule of NADH coming out. Okay, you're gonna see two things. You're gonna see NADH, not to be confused with NADPH. Okay, it's different. NADH and FADH2, they're both gonna be used in cellular respiration. The way that I remember this, so NADPH is in photosynthesis. Well, what does photosynthesis start with? A P. NADH is cellular respiration. It's missing the P, so therefore it's cellular respiration. What are these molecules? NADPH, NADH, FADH2. What are these? These are electron carriers. Okay, and those electron carriers are going to eventually go, if you scroll down, this NADH, 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 FADH2, these are all gonna go to the electron transport chain and they're gonna run that, okay, over and over again. And that's gonna get, eventually give me all this ATP, okay? So NADH, FADH2, these are electron carriers that are gonna run the electron transport chain, okay? So let's backtrack, okay? So now I have two, three carbon pyruvates after glycolysis. I have two options here. If oxygen is present, I can go through cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is very efficient Okay, it gives us the most ATP for one glucose molecule. If oxygen is not present or I can't get oxygen fast enough to the cell, we'll go through fermentation. I'm going to come back to that. Okay, I want to really spend some time on cellular respiration here. So if oxygen is present, the pyruvates are going to diffuse into the mitochondria, right? Because remember, glycolysis happens in the cytosol or right outside the mitochondria. Once uh, I realize oxygen is present, those two three carbon pyruvates are going to diffuse into the mitochondria, okay? And we're going to go through this intermediate step, which was not mentioned earlier in the slideshow. So you'll see here, there's no intermediate step here. 
But the inter inter intermediate step is pretty important. I'm going to scroll to here. Okay. So the intermediate step is when those pyruvates made via glycolysis diffuses into the mitochondria. As it diffuses, it loses a carbon. So I put the intermediate step here because it helps with the math. Okay. The fact that we start with to a, a three carbon pyruvate molecule and end up with a two carbon acetyl CoA, you kind of have to have this step in there because you're going to want to know, well, where did that carbon go? So that carbon was actually the first carbon that was released as carbon dioxide. Remember, in cellular respiration, carbon dioxide is released. So we have one pyruvate going in, we lose a CO2 molecule, and we end up with this acetyl CoA. Notice we also have an NADH here. So I'm going to go back. Okay, here, two, three carbon pyruvates going to go in, going to go through the intermediate step. That's where a CO2 is going to be released. And I'm also going to get one of those electron carriers. Okay, now my pyruvate has been fixed. Remember, carbon fixed changes carbon into two, two carbon acetyl coas. So I had two, three carbon pyruvates. And now I have two, two carbon acetyl coas because I lost two, technically it's two carbon dioxide molecules. Okay. So now I have this carbon molecule. Okay. That carbon molecule is going to go into the Krebs cycle. And notice I skipped glycolysis here. This is a lot of stuff that you don't necessarily have to know. The only thing I do want to mention is that it's anaerobic. You don't need oxygen for glycolysis. I mentioned everything that you have to know when I was talking about this here, how you get for ATP, NADH, all that. That's all the real stuff that you have to know. These slides go into a lot more detail than I really want you to know as of right now. So moving on from glycolysis, then we realize oxygen is present. Uh, so I go and go diffuse into the mitochondria and I'm going to go through the intermediate step. I'm going to release CO2 and that's going to give me this 2,2-carbon two, two acetyl-CoA uh, molecule. Okay. That acetyl CoA molecule is going to go to through the Krebs cycle. This is when more carbon dioxide is going to be released. Again, this is a lot of information that you don't necessarily have to know. The only thing I really want you to know is pretty much this flow chart, right? So that 2 2 carbon acetyl CoA goes to the Krebs cycle. And what the Krebs cycle does is the Krebs cycle is going to give me 2 ATP and it's going to give me all these electron carriers. It gives me a ton of NADH, a ton of FADH2, which again, these are electron carriers. Okay, and those electron carriers are there to go into the next part, which again, I'm going to kind of skip over here. The next part, which is the electron transport chain. It occurs in the inner membrane of the mitochondria, and this is where I'm going to take all those electron carriers. So this NADH from glycolysis, the NADH from intermediate step, the NADH and FADH2 from the Krebs cycle. All of those electron carriers are going to, are really there to run the electron transport chain. And the electron transport chain is a really efficient way to basically drop electrons across the membrane to release energy to give us ATP. And there's actually a really good um, video. I think it's from Bozeman. And he does a really good uh, animation on showing you how the and how we get the energy from these electron transport or electron carriers so i'll make sure to post that with all this information so that if you're still confused on like how these electron carriers release all of this atp um, you can watch that video and that'll really help so that is cellular respiration okay the one thing I also want to mention is that oxygen is the final electron acceptor. I had a, I had a professor in college, his name was Dr. Bortnick, and he was my botany professor. And he would make us say this every day. We weren't even on cellular respiration. He made us say that oxygen is the final acceptor. And what this does is it basically acts as, um, it basically collects that last electron. So I'll mention that when I go into the next slide. So oxygen is the final. So why do we need oxygen in cellular respiration? It's to be that final acceptor. But you guys don't know what that means. What the heck does that mean, a final acceptor? Okay, so the next slide, we'll talk about it. All right, so what happens is I have, and again, I'm going to post that Bozeman video too, so you can get this kind of a couple of ways. What happens is the electron transport chain is basically there to move hydrogens across a membrane. Okay. Cross membrane. That's what we want to do. So we want to move them from a low to high concentration. 
What is it called when I want to move a molecule from a low concentration to a high concentration? Active transport. What do I need in order to run active transport? Energy. Okay. So what happens is I have this electron carrier. Okay. That electron carrier is going to release an electron through the membrane. Okay. And that electron, the energy in that electron is going to move hydrogens from a low to high power, low to high power, low to high power, and low to high power. So now I have all these hydrogens here. Okay. Once that electron runs out of energy, we don't want the electron to stay there. We want the electron to move out of the way. So the way that I always remember this is if you ever, as a kid, played um, squeeze a lemon on a slide. Did you ever do that? I know I did it. I was a great squeeze a lemoner. Like I held that slide strong. Okay. What happens is if this electron here doesn't move and doesn't get moved, it acts like a squeeze the lemon. So it basically blocks all these other electrons. Therefore, we can't do any more cellular respiration or any more electron transport chain. So what happens is to avoid the squeeze the lemon approach, this oxygen combines with the hydrogen, okay? And it basically takes that electron away. So now it's kind of like a circle. The electrons go, electrons go, okay? They get taken from, and then from the oxygen and that gives us water molecule. So that's why water is a product of cellular respiration. It's that oxygen combining with electrons and hydrogens to create water, okay? And that moves the electron out of the way. So therefore we don't have a squeeze the lemon situation. So now after all these electrons have moved down the electron transport chain and they've released hydrogens across the cell membrane, I have a ton of hydrogens here and I don't have a lot of hydrogens here. So what's gonna happen? The hydrogens are gonna wanna move from a high to low concentration. They're gonna wanna go through passive transport. But what happens is the cell takes advantage of that. We have this ATP synthase here. And if you remember in photosynthesis, we talked about chemiosmosis, right? Chemiosmosis is using an enzyme, ATP synthase, to give us ATP. We have all these hydrogens here. They're gonna to wanna to move from a high to low concentration. As they do that, think of ATP synthase as that turbine that's gonna turn, okay? So similar to like steam power, right? The reason why we use nuclear power is to give us steam to turn a turbine. That's essentially what's happening here. Hydrogens are gonna move from a high to low concentration. We're gonna use that flow, okay, to give us energy. So think of this as a little turbine. It's gonna turn, 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 turn. We're gonna get an ATP molecule. This is gonna happen over and over and over again until we run out of electrons or electron carriers. Okay, and again, the, I already mentioned chemiosmosis is happening here because we're using uh, ATP synthase to give us ATP. Energy from the electrons are being released, we're moving hydrogens from a low to high power. Then those hydrogens are gonna wanna move from a high to low, okay? So we're gonna use that, inf that flow to turn that ATP synthase turbine to give us ATP. And if you're still super confused on this, which guys, this is probably the hardest thing to understand in the second semester. Yeah, the first semester was terrible, right? We had atoms, we had, not atoms, I'm sorry. We had, you know, organelles, we had all that crazy stuff. This is the hardest part of second semester. So I'm really trying here, especially from home, it's tough, okay? Um, and I will tell you the quiz I'm going to make easier than it was for them last year. Uh, but I still want you guys to try to get the concept because I think it's kind of important to understand that this is happening in your body every day. Um, so that's why I still kind of want to teach it in the d detail that I'm, that I'm used to. Okay. So again, this is the electron transport chain. How much ATP are we getting here per glucose molecule? Well, if you go back, it tells you the net ATP gain. So how much do we get is 36 to 38 ATP. The reason why that's not a straight number is because sometimes it's more efficient. Sometimes it's less efficient. And also Sometimes we don't count glycolysis in it. If we count glycolysis in the entire cellular, cellular respiration, um, then it would be 38 ATP. If we're not counting glycolysis in this situation, it would be 36 because we get two ATP from glycolysis and then we get 36 from this oxygen present cellular respiration section. So this is cellular respiration. We have 
glycolysis, the intermediate step that gives us acetylcholine, the Krebs cycle that gives us those electron carriers. And then we have those electron carriers going into the electron transport chain, and that's going to give us 36 to 38 ATP. That's the hardest part. Electron transport chain is the hardest part of this whole thing. Understanding how the hydrogens move across and all that kind of stuff, ATP synthase, chemia osmosis, it's crazy. Okay, it's a lot of information. So if you got the electron transport chain, which you might not, it's cool. Like I said, I'm going to post the Bozeman and then I can also talk to you guys this week. Um, if you want to do a Zoom, whatever, that's fine. Um, but check out that Bozeman if you're still super confused on the electron transport chain. I highly recommend it. All right, so let's talk about, I'm going to skip down. There's the overview, so I just mentioned that. Let's talk about cellular respiration versus fermentation. So again, if you look here, glucose turns into pyruvate through glycolysis. If oxygen is present, it's going to go into the mitochondria and it's going to go through cellular respiration. If oxygen is not present, it's going to go through fermentation. Okay. And fermentation, and I'm going to skip this slide because I think it's more confusing than helpful. Um, so there are two different types of fermentation, actually. So there's alcoholic fermentation. And then there's also lactic acid fermentation. Which one do we go through? Which one are you more familiar with? You've probably heard of lactic acid building up in your muscles, right? Lactic acid fermentation creates lactate. Okay, and lactate is just a byproduct. Lactic acid really isn't useful in the muscles. It just makes your muscles hurt, right? What lactic acid fermentation does, though, is it creates this NAD plus molecule. I know there's another electron carrier, cheese and crackers. There's so many electron carriers. That NAD plus is only simply made to keep glycolysis running. So that NAD plus goes into glycolysis to give us two ATP versus one glucose molecule. So think about it. If oxygen is not present, we're going through lactic acid fermentation. Is that as efficient as cellular respiration? The answer is no, right? Cellular respiration gives us 36 to 38 ATP. Lactic acid fermentation doesn't make energy itself. It makes NAD plus that then runs glycolysis to only make two ATP. So lactic acid fermentation is not efficient. When do we go through lactic acid fermentation? Well, when you're running a marathon, right? So we're just running it all. Eventually, you're body can't take in enough oxygen to help feed your muscles. So what happens is when that oxygen isn't getting there fast enough, your body goes through lactic acid fermentation, creating lactate, that soreness in your muscles, okay, and NAD plus and keeps glycolysis going. So it still gives you energy, just not as much. So that's lactic acid fermentation. Who goes through alcohol? Oh, by the way, lactic acid fermentation doesn't release any carbon dioxide. No CO2 is released. Cool. Okay. So now alcohol fermentation, instead of releasing lactic acid or lactate, it releases ethanol. Okay. And this is how alcohol is produced or ethanol is produced. So wines, beers, these are all going through alcoholic fermentation. Is the beer itself going through it? No, it's the yeast they use to create the alcohol. Okay. So what happens is yeast go through alcohol fermentation. And if you go back, you can see alcohol fermentation releases carbon dioxide. So those are the bubbles, okay? Releases carbon dioxide, and it also releases NAD+, just like lactic acid fermentation. So that NAD+, again, just keeps glycolysis running, okay? It doesn't make alcohol fermentation and lactic acid fermentation, neither of those make their own energy. They create these electron carriers to keep glycolysis running. So versus one glucose to give us one glucose molecule that can give us two ATP or one glucose molecule that can give us 36 to 38. Obviously, cellular respiration is more complex um, and more efficient. So going back, the last thing I want to talk about, okay, is versus alcohol versus lactic acid fermentation. Alcohol fermentation gives us ethanol and it gives off CO2. Lactic acid fermentation does not give off CO2 and makes lactic acid. Both of these start with pyruvate for glycolysis, from glycolysis, and don't make ATP on their own. Both of them create NAD plus to be ba sent back to glycolysis to keep glycolysis running. Okay. So that is 
all of it. So I just went through this whole flow chart. We talked about cellular respiration. We talked about glycolysis. Uh, all four steps needed to go through cellular respiration. That includes glycolysis, okay? We also talked about fermentation. So use this information, guys, to help you with the review questions that I'm going to post. Uh, I think I'm going to give you a couple of days, so probably Monday and Tuesday, to kind of watch this, watch the Bozeman video, and do the review questions. And then um, Wednesday and Thursday, you have a lab scheduled. Friday is a makeup day, so enjoy that. Um, so I'm not going to assign anything for you guys on Friday. Any questions, please shoot me a remind. Um, I'm feel free to, we can zoom this week. Just let me know what time I got to make sure my kid's asleep because he's crazy. Um, so just let me know if you have any questions. This is a lot of information to take in. I get it after having photos of this. This is crazy. Okay. But this is the last hard part of biology. I don't want to say the rest of the year isn't hard, but this is really hard com compared to the end. So just take this in. Okay. And ask questions when you need to, and please pay attention to all the videos that I post. Make sure to actually watch them because I think they're super duper helpful. All right. Have a good day, everybody, and good luck.